favor. So those doctrines that really explain why none of salvation is of us, but it is of God alone. And so the foundational doctrine in this category of the doctrines of grace or the subject of the doctrines of grace, it is the doctrine of the total depravity of man. In other words, the total depravity of man is what makes the doctrines of grace necessary if anyone is to be saved. I review total depravity in all 22 sermons in this series. And so you should have some idea of what it, is, of what it means exactly. But just in case you are still not certain, permit me to just shortly review. The total depravity of man does not mean a person, you or I, are as sinful and evil as we can be, but it does mean we are all as bad off as we can be because we have a sin nature in us, which makes it possible for any of us to commit the most horrible acts of sin and evil. None of us is as bad as we could be, but the possibility is there because we have a sin nature that can lead us into any evil possible. Thank God, most of you have never never done all that your sinful mind told you to do, amen? amen. Uh, we have probably four or five murderers up in here, amen? <laughs> but the propensity and the capacity, it is there because of the sin nature. And so this sin nature that we have, it separates all from God by a chasm or a gap, which is infinite in distance. In other words, it's too, too much of a gap for you and I to jump to get from where we are now to God. And so our sin nature, it separates us from God. It makes all of us wholly unable to please God. It makes us all wholly unable to turn to God away from the world. It makes all of us wholly unable to trust God. It makes all of us holy or entirely unable to understand God to such an extent that we can contribute anything to us being saved or any of us spending our eternity in the presence of God. And so man's total depravity, man's totally depraved sin nature, is what renders every human being who has not been redeemed to be dead in trespasses and sin. We read this over and over in the book of Romans 3, uh, verses 9 through 12, and Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And so it is because man is totally depraved, that's all of us, of any are to be saved, God must work out this salvation in us by his initiative in his power alone. Number one, God must choose or elect us to be saved based on his will and purpose alone because there's nothing in us, we're totally depraved, that would move God to choose us. So God must choose. And he does it according to his will, his purpose, his plan. Number two, those God chooses to save. They are the ones the Father gives to Jesus. And it is these Jesus specifically died for on the cross to secure their salvation. And so we call this the doctrine of limited atonement. The one before that is unconditional election. And then number three, those who God chose to save according to his will alone. They can do nothing to turn themselves to God. Why? Because we are totally depraved. Therefore, in order for them to be saved, God must exercise his irresistible or effective, never failing grace towards them. And this efficacious grace of God, this effective grace of God, it regenerates the heart and the mind. Um, it inclines a person towards God. It enables a person to understand the gospel. And this effective, never failing grace, it always overcomes everything that prevents a person from willingly receiving Christ and the salvation. It overcomes our sin, our unbelief, our spiritual ignorance, our stubbornness. And so God's irresistible grace, it always ends in a person coming to Christ under salvation 
through repentance and faith. The reason why is irresistible grace, it is effective grace. Amen. Never fails. We studied all of this in the life of Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where Paul stated God's grace towards him when he was in his unredeemed state. It was not in vain, but it was effective in bringing about his conversion. And so now we turn to the last of the doctrines of grace, and that is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. So remember, man is totally depraved, therefore God must choose those who are to be saved to be saved. Um, it is these Jesus died for on the cross, and then God regenerates us to <coughs> give life to the mind and heart in order that we might understand the gospel and incline us towards Christ. And then we willingly come to him in salvation through repentance and faith. And then the last one of these is the perseverance of saints. The phraseology perseverance of the saints. It is probably not the best way to state this doctrine. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is more accurately called the doctrine of the perseverance of God with the saints. It is God persevering with you. This doctrine can be defined as the fact that God perseveres with the Christian or the believer, starting from the moment they are converted by receiving Christ as Savior, and he perseveres with them, and he constantly keeps them from falling away from Christ or losing their salvation, as they would certainly do if God were not keeping them or preserving them. Amen. If God did not persevere with us, we would never persevere with him. Amen. Teach us. I like the way Dr. John MacArthur states this. And he's written this in many of his publications. I like it. And so he gets the credit. I didn't say it, but he said it. But he says this. If a believer could lose their salvation, they would. <laughs> if we who are trusted in Christ and the salvation could lose our salvation, we all would lose it. And the reason we all would, would is because even though we are redeemed, we still have sin issues, which are rooted and grounded in our sinful and totally depraved nature. Or, if God saved a person from their sin, and then the completion of their salvation rests solely upon them, they would certainly be lost or go into eternal separation from God because of the sin issues which remain in believers and with believers until the day they die or until Jesus returns and catches away his bride to church, and his bride to church is everyone who knows him as Savior. If we are honest, we all know, even though we may not be living like the unredeemed, if we're honest, even though we're not living like the world, we still have sin issues, yes. which would certainly send us to hell if in the end, our redemption was dependent on our behavior, our deeds, our thought life, our motives, and our spoken words. Amen. Now, Sunday morning is one of the most dishonest periods <laughs> in the week. Because we get to church on Sunday morning and we're all saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, Ain't done nothing to make my Lord ashamed. I want y'all to pray for me that I go stronger and be the one he's calling for in these last and evil days. <laughs> I've never heard anybody testify on Sunday morning, I'm struggling with sin in my life. Well, I'm struggling with a besetting sin. I'm struggling in my thought life. Sometimes when I open up my mouth, a word comes out that shouldn't. So Sunday morning is one of the most dishonest periods of time 
during the week and we have enough nerve to talk about we're worshiping God. Teach us. But we are honest. We have to admit, even though we didn't live like the devil last week, we still struggle with sin. And that sin that remains, it is why God must persevere with us. Because if he didn't, none of us would be saved. But on the other hand, because God perseveres with the Christian, or because God persistently saved the Christian or the believer, because God persevered with you, you persevere with God. Because God is persevering with you, the result is you persevere with God. I didn't say you were perfect. I said you persevere with God. Because God perseveres with you, even though sin may knock you down. He never lets you stay down for the count. Amen. You always get up and you continue with God. Amen. Because God has his hand on you. Uh -huh. The leg may shake and you may struggle, but you never are loose from his hand. Amen. Because God continues with you, you continue with him. Amen. And you continuing with God is the proof that he is continuing with you. Yes. You persevering with your God is the evidence that God is persevering with you. Amen. So this is what the three portions of scripture we read in our sermon text teach. In John 10, 26 to 29, Jesus talks about his sheep. He said, my sheep, they hear my voice. So these are believers. Those who believe in Christ as Messiah and Savior. And so it is to these the Lord says in that verse he gives eternal life. According to Jesus, these will never perish. Jesus used the word never in this text and it's a Greek word, ion or aion, and it's used in the negative sense. And it means never in relationship to time. In other words, what the Lord is saying, there will never be a time that any one of his sheep perish. Amen. And the word perish, apolumai, it means to be deprived of eternal life. Or to be excluded from the kingdom of the Messiah, to be excluded from the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Therefore, in this text, our Lord is saying that his sheep, believers, these are the ones he gives eternal life. And these shall never be excluded from the kingdom of God, or they will never be deprived of eternal life. They will never be deprived of salvation. They will never be deprived of spending eternity in the immediate and lower presence of God. And the reason why Jesus' sheep will never be excluded from the kingdom of the Messiah, or the reason why they will never be deprived of eternal life, because he says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. And the reason why Jesus' sheep shall never perish is because no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. For the Lord says he is greater than all. Amen. Now, if you notice, right, in the next verse, the Lord says, I and the Father are one. Yes. And so what he's saying here, when he says, I and the Father are one, he says we are distinct persons, I, Greek word is ego, and Kai, me, so he makes a distinction between he and his father, but he says we are one, and one is neutral or neuter in that text. And what he's saying is the father and I, we are a distinct person, but we are exactly the same. We are the same thing. And so what he's saying is, is my, it is my hand and the father's hand, they are one and the same hand. Amen. Amen. And none of my sheep will ever perish. Because no one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. And we have one in the same hand. So the reason why you don't fall is because there's nobody powerful enough to make you fall. Yes. The Lord doesn't lose his sheep. Now the reason why he lose the summer is because they never were sheep, they're goats. Amen. Amen. Teach us. Bulls, stubborn bulls, 
It is amazing that a Christian can read this text and still believe a person who has truly been saved or they really know Christ as Savior can end up being lost, but there are many. I've had to tell me, no, no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand, but you can jump out. <laughs> And I thought God's hand was infinite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, God's hand is a hand, but it doesn't have an edge to jump off of. It's immense. <laughs> infinite in relationship to space. There's no place where God's hand is not there. Mm -hmm. And so somebody said, you can jump around from knuckle to knuckle, but you just can't get away. Mm -hmm. And some of you, you've experienced this, you try to go back out in the world, and it just don't work. Because no man can snatch you, Jesus says, from my hand. That's God persevering with the saints. His hand has a firm grip on you. And because he never lets go of you, you never let go of him. Philippians 1.6. Notice in this book, the Apostle Paul, under the revelation and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, He is confident of this very thing, that he, God, who began a good work in the Philippians, he said he would perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Or until the day these Philippians were in the immediate presence of God. Paul says, I'm confident. It's a Greek word. Hey, though, it means to be assured. Paul was assured. And so Paul, by revelation and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was assured that the salvation was begun, was begun by God in these Philippians. It would be brought to a completion. By who? By God! Until the day they were safely in the presence of Christ. And I want you to notice, I don't know if you noticed it in that Philippians 1 text, that the Holy Spirit through Paul is very clear that the one who began the work of salvation in the Philippians was God. Yes, yes. And the one who would complete or perfect it until the day of Christ, it was God. And so, you know, Paul's assurance was based on God was the one who began the work of salvation in them, and God was the one who would complete the work of salvation in them. So his confidence was not in the flesh. His confidence was not in, you know, I'm running, trying to make 100, 99 and a half, won't do. His assurance was not in, I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain, doing my best to make it in. And I've said long ago, somebody ought to burn every last copy of that song. Because you can't do your best to make it in. His assurance was in God. Because God began it, and God is going to perfect it. And so that's God persevering with his people. And so, and so this verse reveals God's perseverance with his people in assuring their salvation. He began it, and he'll bring it to completion. And then in the first John 2, 19 text, in that verse that you all read twice. <laughs> In this verse, the Apostle John, by revelation and inspiration of the Spirit of God, he was really writing about a group of men who claimed to be Christian. They were called antinomians. They claimed to be Christians. They claimed to be believers. They were no doubt leaders in the church. But they stopped believing in the humanity of Christ. So they stopped believing that Jesus was a real man of flesh, blood, and bones when he walked this earth. Instead, they began to teach the Lord was some kind of ghost or phantom spirit who only appeared to be a human, but he really wasn't. And so they denied that Jesus was a real man. So you know, we have two, two extremes today. We have some, they deny Jesus was God. They don't believe he was equal to the Father. Then the other extremists deny that he was truly human. And so by then, denying the humanity of Christ, 
They were, they, they were denied an essential aspect.